Okay. Ah, there we go. All right. Um, due to technical difficulties, the last lecture was not recorded, which is really sad because it was my favorite lecture so far this quarter. You know, I had everything you want. Uh, so we should at least talk about what we talked about last time, but we would have done this anyways. So we talked about manipulating limits which approach 0 over 0, and this is really important because what we're going to deal with are limits which go to 0 over 0. And our goal in all of these, when you have 0 over 0, is we say, well, look, something is causing it to go to 0. And hopefully it's the same thing happening on the top and the bottom that's causing my 0. And so if I could cancel that out, then I don't have that 0 over 0 problem anymore. So our, our goal is to somehow cancel zeros. And there's a couple of techniques. One is we re rewrite. This is very useful for polynomials. For example, you can expand and then factor. Another thing you can do is multiply the top and the bottom by conjugates. And multiplying by top and bottom means you multiply by 1, which is OK. Multiplying by 1 doesn't change anything. And today we'll see an example of adding 0, which is useful. And 0 doesn't change anything. And the other thing we can do is, of course, use identities, which is helpful for trigonometry. And we did a little bit of review of trigonometry. Uh, in this class, for the test, probably what do you need to know for trigonometry? The basics about sine, cosine, tangent, how they're related, uh, secant. Uh, you also will probably want to know the angles between 0 and pi halves, and then, of course, pi, 2 pi. And if, oh, of course, our, the coolest identities are sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. And it's just, you get to do so much with it. And you don't realize how much you get to do with it until you take uh, the second half of calculus. And in fact, a lot of what you learn in trigonometry seems to be kind of pointless until you really take a really hard, good calculus class in the second quarter. Uh, sorry, let me move this out of the way. And then you say, aha, there was a reason why they subjected this to all, our, all this madness to us. OK, so that was manipulating limits. And we're going to do some more of that today because we're going to be doing uh, derivatives, and those involve limits. We also talked about, I didn't write it down here, but this is the squeeze. Or you could call it the squash, or you could call it the squish, or I guess you could call it the sasquatch, but that probably is not the right name for it. Um, and the idea here is you have three functions. You have a top function, u of x, I think of that as the upper function. You have a bottom function, l of x, which I think of as the lower function. And then you have this function, f of x, which goes back and forth between. And the following is true. If near c, so here is c, we have that the function f of x is in between this upper and lower function. And the limit of the lower function and the limit of the upper function as we approach c are equal, they both exist, and they both equal k, then the limit of the function f of x also equals k. Because essentially, just think of the intuition, it's in between. And so as you come in, there's not a lot of room for f of x to wiggle around. So for example of this, suppose I ask you about what is the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine 1 over x. This is actually kind of an interesting function, but we won't know why it's interesting for another two weeks. So unfortunately, we'll have to wait till after the midterm to learn why this is cool. Uh, but suppose I ask you what this limit is. Well, we already did the limit of sine 1 over x. We said, well, that's just a really bad function because it does all these infinite oscillations as we approach near 0. So we think, OK, well, we know what's going to happen. We have all these infinite oscillations, so probably the limit doesn't exist. But then we say, wait a second, hold on. He threw in this x squared term. That might mess us up a little bit. So we have to step back and we think about sine. And we say, well, what do we know about sine? And we, we, we might think back to a long time, you know, old music. I saw the sine, you know. Or, no, that's not the right thing. What we know about sine, this is a really cool fact. It's always between negative 1 and 1. It's bounded. No matter where you look at sine, it's always between negative 1 and 1. And you can use this fact. So for instance, what does this say? This says x squared sine 1 over x. Well, it's less than or equal to x squared, because this is less than or equal to 1. And it's bigger than or equal to negative x squared. So our picture here is we have our upper function, which is x squared, looks like something like this. We have our lower function, which is negative x squared, looks something like this, except they actually meet at 0. And then we have x squared, so 1 over x. And so what happens is, because it's in between, even though we're doing these infinite oscillations, it can't balance back and forth very much. 
This is going to go to zero as we go to zero. This is going to go to zero as we go to zero. Therefore, what can we conclude about x squared sine 1 over x? It goes to zero, exactly. Now we did a more complicated example. Namely, we looked at the limit as x goes to zero sine x over x. And this is a very important limit, as we'll see. It allows to do some things. In particular, it allows to take derivatives of uh, trigonometric functions. So we set up some areas. The proof is in the book. Um, all right. So that was it for limits. Now we want to jump into the chapter three, which talks about derivatives. So we started the class on the first day. We talked about instantaneous rate of change. And we said, OK, so the instantaneous rate of change is the slope of the tangent line. Well, we have a problem in that. It's, it's hard to find the slope of the tangent line. Well, what's easy to find? Well, what's easy to find are slopes of secant lines. And so that slope of secant line is essentially this term inside here. So the slope of the tangent line at x equals a, we denote with this notation f prime of a. And this is how you read f prime of a. Or you could say the derivative of f at a, but it's usually easier to say f prime of a. And the idea is we look at these secant lines. So we have our function. We have our point a. And what we do is we just take a small distance, if you like, a small run over to a plus h. And we say, OK, what's the slope of this secant line? Because the slope of that secant line is probably going to be a pretty good approximation for the slope of the tangent line that we want. And so we set up the slope of the secant line, rise over run. And now we take the limit as h goes to 0, because as h goes to 0, the secant line gets closer and closer to our tangent line. And now we have our answer. Now, there are, of course, a couple of different ways you could set this expression up. So the idea is we're taking slopes of secant lines. So instead of doing a and a plus h, I could have done a and b. So that at this point, a f of a is where I want to find this slope of the tangent line. Here I have my point b f of b. And the slope of the secant line is the rise f of a minus f of b over the run a minus b. And now it's b goes to a. So there's a couple of ways to write this expression for taking the derivative. But in all cases, essentially, it's the same idea. We're going to set up a slope of secant lines. We're going to take a limit as we go to 0. All right. So that's what we did last time. And today is another jam-packed lecture, because we have to cram in a lot of material before the midterm. So let's start with some simple th problems. Here's a nice fact from the book. Suppose we have our function, f of x is mx plus b. So in other words, our function is a line, which we know really well. Here's a question for you. What is f prime of a? And a can be anything right now. Now hopefully we should just be able to look at this and say, aha, this is one of those trick questions where it looks like we have to think, but in fact we don't. Because we like to avoid thinking. OK, so if this is our function, f of x equals mx plus b, what's the tangent line? Yeah, the tangent line, well, what, tangent, what line looks like the function? The tangent line is also the same thing, y equals mx plus b. And what's our slope of this tangent line? It's just the slope. So it's m. OK, so now we know how to take derivatives of lines. So woo -hoo, all right, feeling good. Um, oh, here's another fun problem. This is actually uh, similar to a problem from the homework. Suppose I ask the following question. I tell you that y equals, we'll make numbers up, 2x minus 5 is the tangent line to f of x at x equals 2. But I'm not going to tell you what f of x is. I'm just going to tell you, well, I have a function, and I know that this is a tangent line, 2f of x at x equals 2. And I suppose I ask for the following two pieces of information. What is f of 2? Well, let's say 3. What is f of 3? And what is f prime of 2? <coughs> All right, let's start with this one. What is f of 2? Well, what do we know? We know only one thing. The only thing we know is the tangent line. So we have this line y equals 2x minus 5. And let's say this is 1. 
I don't know anything about the function except that it has a tangent line here. And so I know that the tangent line has to be tangent to the function, and, and hence the name tangent line. You know, very coincidental, you might say, but it's, it's still true. So if I know what the value of the tangent line is at x equals 2, then I know the value of the function at x equals 2. Huh? Huh? Yeah? Yeah? OK. OK, so what is f of 2? Yeah, negative 1, because I plug in x equals 2, and I get 4 minus 5 is negative 1. How about f of 3? This is a trick question. We don't know. Because the only piece of information we have is the tangent line, and the tangent line tells us something about what's happening at 2. Because my function could do lots of things. It could do something like this. It could do something like this. I mean, who knows? It could cross. So the only thing that the tangent line gives you is what happens at 2, and it tells you something about what's happening near 2. But as soon as you get away from 2, you have no idea. So keep in mind, tangent lines really are only useful at the point of tangency, which is why I threw this one in. Oh, sorry, I forgot my prime. What about f prime of 2? It's 2, right? Because the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, and we have the tangent line. So there we have it. OK, so we can use tangent lines to recover some information about the function. And eventually, we'll learn in the latter half of the course how we can use the, the derivative, which is essentially the collection of slopes of tangent lines, to recover the function that we started with. OK, so that was essentially section 3.1. Now, section 3.2 is this huge leap. So let me write down what happens. Actually, I, I can do it over here. So section 3.2 does this massive trick, which says, replace that by that, and replace that by that, and lo and behold, we have a new section of the book. In other words, replace A by the X. Now, of course, there's something a little bit deeper going on. Previously, we were looking at the derivative at a point, and we were looking at essentially a, a number, a value. Now we're saying, well, let's not think of the derivative as just a, at a point where we get a number out. Let's just think of it as a function. So now we're thinking of f prime of x. This is a function of x. And what we're going to do is, as x varies, essentially we'll go through and we could calculate the derivative at every single point, and that gives us a number. And that's really what a derivative, sorry, that's really what a function is. A function is a rule. And the rule says, you give me a number, and I tell you another number. It's, it's like a machine. So the way I like to think of functions, you have this. I just like to draw this picture, you know. I didn't get to go to art school, so you know, anytime I get to draw. So you throw in an x, there's this function we call f prime, out shoots f prime of x. So that's what a, what a function is. You, you give it an input, out comes a number. So even though it kind of looks like a strange definition of a function where we have this limit and, and have this ratio here, it's still a function. It's a rule. If I tell you a value of x, and you know what the function is, you can compute f of x. Apply the rule. OK, so let's go through and do an example. So suppose I tell you that y is equal to f of x is equal to x squared plus x. Now, occasionally, we'll, we'll switch back and forth between saying y equals x squared plus x and f of x equals x squared plus x. So y prime is the same as just saying f prime. So whenever I talk about y prime, it's just the derivative of the function of y. So what do we do? Well, we apply the rule. So we're going to find the function f prime of x, which is going to be a limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So far, I haven't done anything profound. All I've done is just copy the definition, but it's a good start. So the next step is to actually write out what is this expression. What is f of x plus h? What is f of x? So we just do our substitution using the definition. So f of x plus h. So I come over here. I know what f of x is. It's x squared plus x. So what is f of x plus h? Well, I just replace everywhere where I see an x, I replace it by x plus h squared. And just to help me keep track, I'm just going to put some brackets here. So I remember that this is the f of x plus h term. Similarly, f of x, well, that's really easy. I, again, I'll put some brackets 
so I can keep track. So the brackets help me so I, I remember not to forget the minus sign. It's really easy to forget that minus sign and, and it can throw us off. All right, over h. Okay, so what's our next step? Well, if we were to plug in h equals zero, it's easy to check we'll get zero over zero, and that always happens for derivatives. So we always come to one of these th techniques. We have to rewrite, we have to multiply, use identities, uh, hope that a miracle happens, you know, one of those things. The last one is not very good for test. In this case, I mean, there's really not much we can do. And so we're pretty much said, well, the only thing we really have available to us is just expand everything out. So let's do that. So x plus h squared is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus x plus h minus x squared minus x. And so remember, the minus will come through to both terms. OK, now what can we do? So we're now we can simplify. Because notice, for instance, we have an x squared here, and we have a negative x squared here, and so they cancel out. I should use a different symbol than x, because it looks like I'm just writing the x bigger. There we go. OK. Similarly, we have a plus x, and we have a minus x. So we can write those, cancel those out. What's left? Let's just see what we have. We have 2xh plus h squared plus h all divided by h. Well, notice it's the h on the bottom that's causing the problem. So if we could factor an h out on top, we'd be happy. And we can. And now we can cancel off the h's. So we're now down to the limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus h plus 1. And now we're happy. Because whereas before, if we plugged in h equals 0, we would have gotten 0 over 0. We no longer have that problem. Woohoo! You know, this is always an important step in mathematics. You get to the woohoo point, you know. All right, so we're at that point, And now we can just plug in h equals 0. And we see, aha, that's going to go to 0 as h goes to 0. And so we can say it's 2x plus 1. OK, so after all that work, we can now write derivative of x squared plus x is 2x plus 1. Now, some things that we might notice here. Uh, one, we got an answer, and it, it is the right answer. Uh, two, it was kind of a really long process to get to that answer. And it's kind of thinking to ourselves, boy, I don't want to do this every single time I have to take a derivative. So the good news is we don't have to do that every single time we take derivatives. And really what we want to do is just set up some basic rules. And once we have the rules, we can skip all these limits. So they all go to the background. So now, we're, today, the main thing about today is we're just going to try to develop a bunch of rules for taking derivatives so we don't have to do limits. It's still nice to know the definition. When in doubt, we can always go back to it. And the definition also helps us define the rules and make sure that they work. Uh, before we go through doing the rules, let me mention one other thing. There's notation. Another way to write the derivative of y is using d, dx, y, or dy over dx. So dy over dx, you can think of d as sort of like a small, almost infinitesimal change, or a small change. So think of this as small change in y over small change in x. So it's like a rate of change. Uh, or you can think of this, the, what is, is happening to the inside expression? So the derivative of the inside expression, in this case, y, as x is changing our derivative of, of the function y with respect to x. Uh, this is named after Leibniz, and I hope I spell his name right, um, who we don't hear much about because, of course, we were raised with Newton. But if we had been raised in Germany, we would hear about Leibniz, and we wouldn't hear so much about Newton. Uh, what happened was that essentially calculus was developed simultaneously by Newton and Leibniz. And you know, there's, there's big controversy, even today. There's a big controversy. Who was the first person to create calculus? Um, it often happens in mathematics that, in fact, lots of people develop the same theory simultaneously. It just coincidence are just the right time. Uh, so Leibniz notation is, he's the one who came up with this DDX. And in fact, his is probably the better notation. How did Newton do derivatives? Um, you don't see this very often. But occasionally, if you take enough classes, you'll get to the point where you see these dots. 
with a dot over the function x, so like x dot. So that's the derivative of x. Kind of a weird notation. So we like Leibniz's notation, so we're going to stick with it. So just as we go through, if you see d dx, just remember that just means take the derivative with respect to x, the variable. All right. So let's start making up some rules. We already know one rule. The derivative of a line is the slope of the line. So we can, for instance, say that the derivative of 1, well, think of this as a line. This is a line y equals 1. What's the slope of that line? 0. So this tells us the derivative of a constant is 0. The derivative of x, again, we can think of this as a line. What's the slope of that line? 1. So the derivative of that is 1. OK. All right. We're making progress. Now we have two rules. Um, how about the derivative of x squared? Wow. You guys are good. You really are. Wow. OK, I'm not quite that fast. So the derivative of x squared, well, definition, h goes to 0. x plus h squared minus x squared all over h. Limit as h goes to 0, x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus x squared all over h. Those cancel. You can cancel off an h. So it's limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus h. This might look familiar because essentially it's the exact same thing we just did, which, again, this went to 0, so it's 2x. OK, so yeah, yeah you're right. Derivative of x squared equals 2x. How about the derivative of x cubed? Wow. I think we've had some, some ringers in this class, people who've had this before. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's 3x squared. Now, uh, in fact, it turns out there's a nice rule, which says the derivative of x to any power, uh, I'll just say a. doesn't matter what the number a is, a whole number. So like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It could be a negative number. It could be a, a, a fraction. It doesn't even have to be a fraction. It could be weird numbers, like square root of 2, or transcendental numbers, like pi. It doesn't matter. No matter what, if you take of x to the a, it's x. It's bring the a down, a x to the a minus 1. So you bring the power of the exponent down. It goes in front. And then you change the power by subtracting 1. So for instance, the root of x squared, the 2 in the exponent came down. And the new power is x to the 2 minus 1, or we just say x to the 1. The root of x cubed, well, the 3 comes down. So 3x, and then the power is 3 minus 1, or 2. OK, so this is our first important rule. So how do we prove this? Well, we cheat. We don't actually prove this correctly here in the book. But let me show you how vaguely it works. So there's something called the binomial theorem which some of you may have heard about when you were in school. You get x plus y to the 1 is x plus y. x plus y squared is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. You know, x plus y cubed, x cubed, 3x squared y. Don't worry, if, if I go too fast on writing the board, this is not important material. I just want to give you an outline of, of how this fact is, it would be proven. And if you were to write down the coefficients of, of the various powers of x's and y's, you get this nice little triangle. So 1, 1, 1, 2, 1. Our coefficients here are 1, 2, 1. Next one is 1, 3, 3, 1. Next one is 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. And so forth and so on. This is called Pascal's triangle. And these coefficients are, are the coefficients that show up when you do this binomial expansion of x plus y to some positive even number. And so they knew about this pattern. In fact, this pattern predates Pascal. I think Pascal was in the 1600s. Uh, but I mean, the Chinese knew about it way before the 1600s, I mean, of course, because they knew about everything way back when. Uh, but then they burned the books, so you know, it doesn't help them. OK. Um, so, so we had this nice pattern. Then along came this rather young upstart mathematician. And he said, you know, this works great. 
for if you have some nice, even, positive integer value. But that might not be the kind of numbers you want to deal with. So he worked on it, and he discovered the nice fact. And he said, for z small, and I'm not going to be very careful here what I mean, but basically, for z small, you get that 1 plus z raised to the power a. It's the following. It's 1 plus az plus a times a minus 1 over 2, z squared. And in general, the pattern is you take a times a minus 1 down to a minus k minus 1, divided by k times k minus 1 down to 1 times z to the k. And then this shape keeps going forever and ever. Now, when you're dealing with a as a positive integer, eventually what's going to happen is you're going to get a 0 up here, and then it terminates. So it's actually a finite sum. The plus dot 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 means it can actually be an infinite sum. Now, the person who created this, we've already met, is Newton. This is Newton's binomial theorem. And he says this works for anything. It doesn't matter what we know about A. A can be anything we want. It's, this is what we have. OK, so let's just assume that we know this is true. Well, the important thing that we get from this, for our perspective, is that if I look at x plus h to the a, then I can write it as the following. It looks like x to the a plus h times a times x to the a minus 1 plus h squared times other stuff. And that basically, you just play around with this expression. You make this expression kind of look like this, and you play around with it, and that's what you get out. OK, so now, if I use this, and I know I'm skipping a lot of steps here, but and unfortunately, it can't be helped at this stage. So limit as h goes to 0, and then we have x plus h to the a minus x to the a divided by h, which looks at, like the limit as h goes to 0. I make this substitution x to the a plus h times a times x to the a minus 1 plus h squared times other stuff. Not very mathematical there. Minus x to the a all over h. Now what happens? Well, what happens is the x to the a terms, similarly as they did before, for instance, when we did the x squared, cancel off. They're gone. Everything that's left has an h in it, so I can cancel off an h here and here. So I get the limit as h goes to 0 of a times x to the a minus 1 plus h times this other stuff. And the important thing about this other stuff is that it's, it's not, it behaves pretty nicely. It doesn't blow up. It's going to go to a number. And so I said, hey, the limit as h goes to 0, this whole part, because there's this h here in front, that's all going to go away. That goes to 0, and we're left with a x to the a minus 1. OK. So there's the proof. So now I can take the derivative of x to any power, which is good, because that's how we form polynomials. Well, we don't just want to take derivatives of x to power. I'd like to be able to take derivatives of polynomials and arbit arbitrary polynomials. So how do I do that? Well, how do I make a polynomial? Well, the way I do a polynomial is I essentially, let's see, should I get this? In? You would think they would have made this like three inches taller <laughs> so we could see the bottom here. OK. Stupid design. That's all right. We'll just switch to our old fashioned chalkboard here. The way I make polynomials, well, is that essentially I combine things that look like this. So for instance, a polynomial would be like f of x is x squared plus x, which we just did a few minutes ago, where I have an x squared that looks like that, and I have an x, and that looks like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing these sort of additive things. So now the next thing I want to say is, well, suppose I have two functions adding together. How do I take the derivative of that? Is there anything I can say about that? So that's our next step. And so we have, suppose that 
we were look, asked to find the derivative of f of x plus g of x. So in other words, I, I have these two functions, and I know how to take the derivative of each one of them individually. And now I'm adding them together. Can I still take the derivative? Is it, is it going to be something I can handle? Any guesses? Yes, OK, good. Then you'll all be surprised. This is going to be exciting. OK, so this is, I just plugged in the definition. This is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h plus g of x plus h. So remember, I'm just doing the definition. So I, I plug x plus h into my function. In this case, my function is these two things add together. Subtract when I plug in just x into my function divided by h. So all I've done is use the definition of the derivative. In fact, that's what we'll do at all these rules. Now notice I can rewrite this. This is the limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x plus g of x plus h minus g of x. all over h. So I haven't done anything fancy. All I've done is take the four terms in the numerator and just shuffle them around. No surprises. But now, what can we do? Where's my eraser? There's my eraser. Now, again, I'll get to use my fancy chalkboard technology here and say, let's just split into two pieces. And we think back to limits. One of the rules we said about limits is if I'm taking a limit of two things added together, if I know the limit of the first piece and I know the limit of the second piece, then the limit is just the sum. So in other words, I can break this up into two limits. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h plus the limit as h goes to 0 g of x plus h minus g of x over h. And that was one of our nice rules about limits. If we know each of the two individual limits, we can just break up over addition. And what does this first piece look like? Well, that's f prime of x. What's the second piece? g prime of x. Or if you like, this is the same as the derivative f of x plus the derivative of g of x. So this is what we call the addition rule. And it says that if you have functions being added together and you want to take the derivative, then you just take the function of each piece and add the results up, and you're done. OK. So that's good. There's another rule, which is called the constant multiple rule, or scaling rule. Well, it's called something. Suppose I have a constant k. So now I have my function. I know how to take the derivative of that. How do I take the derivative of a, a constant times that function? Well, we do the same thing. Limit as h goes to 0, k times f of x plus h minus k times f of x all over h, which is the limit as h goes to 0. And I can rewrite it says k times f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Because essentially what can I do is I can factor k out because k is common to both terms. So I can pull it out. And now there's another rule we talked about for limits, which said if I know the limit of something and then I multiply that inside by a constant, I can pull the constant out. So this is, again, using rules of limits. So this is why we talked about rules of limits, because rules of limits help us nail down rules for derivatives. And now we say, aha, I recognize this. This is k f prime of x. Or if you like, it's k times the derivative of f of x. So now using these three rules, the derivative of x to the power a is a x to the power a minus 1, that the fact that the derivative of f plus g is the derivative of f plus the derivative of g, and the fact that I can pull constants out, that says now I can take the derivative of any polynomial you throw at me. 
No problem. So for instance, we did just a few minutes ago y equals x squared plus x, where we went through and we said, OK, take up a limit, do a lot of work, and we get a number out at the end. Now, if I have y equals x squared plus x, and I ask for the derivative, now we can just almost look at it and start to say what's happening. So what rules do we need here? Well, first off, there's two things, x squared and x, and they're being added together. So the rule says, all right, if I want to find y prime, I take the derivative of the first thing that's being added in. So what's the derivative of x squared? It's 2x. And why is it 2x? Because of this rule here, which we also actually worked it out. OK, 2x. And then you add the derivative of x. What's the derivative of x? 1. Now, wasn't that a lot faster? See, isn't it great to know rules? It's cool to know rules. Rules are awesome. So let's write down these rules. So the derivative of the sum, just take each individual one, add them up. Derivative of a constant, pull the constant out. I'll just say f prime. And derivative of x to the a is a x to the a minus 1. And I, let me just put derivative of a constant derivative of 1 is 0. OK, so those are our basic rules. And these are going to be our basic rules for the next few sections. Um, let's see, where are we up to? We are up to, oh, uh -huh. <laughs> OK, good. All right. So we have been kind of, well, I shouldn't say we. It's really been me. I, I have been somewhat misleading. You might think derivatives always exist, but the fact is they don't. Derivatives don't always exist. So let's take a look at an example of where derivatives don't exist. And there's a couple reasons why derivatives don't exist. So here's a very nice function. Suppose I say my function is the absolute value of x. This is a function that you probably have seen. It looks like a nice V shape here. And oftentimes when I see absolute value of x in calculus, it is helpful to think of this as really two pieces. Namely, it's x if you're bigger than or equal to 0, and it's negative x if you're less than or equal to 0. And of course, if you're 0, it doesn't matter whether you look at 0 or negative 0. One of those full cool facts, 0 is equal to negative 0. OK, suppose I ask you, given that this is my function f of x, what is f prime of x equal to? Well, again, let's just think about it in pieces. Suppose I look away from 0. Suppose I'm over here at x. Now, remember, when I'm talking about limits, I only care about what's happening nearby. So sure, I know something weird is happening at 0, but I don't care about that. I only care about what's happening nearby. And when I look nearby, what function do I see? I don't see the absolute value of x. I see x. So when x is positive, I can say, well, look, I know my function is absolute value of x, but I can just think of it as just plain old x. And x is ordinary. I know how to take the derivative of x. And what's that derivative turn out to be? Yeah, it turns out to be 1, one of the rules we wrote down. So this is if x is greater than 0. Similarly, if I'm down here, if x is less than 0, then even though my function is absolute value of x, I say, well, look, I know my function is absolute value of x, but this piece of it, this little part of it, is negative x. And so I can think of it as just the function negative x when I'm less than 0. What's the derivative of negative x? Negative 1, yeah, because it's just a straight line. And the derivative of a straight line is the slope if x is less than 0. Now you can probably see our problem. So if we're bigger than 0, we have 1. If we're less than 0, we have negative 1. And of course, what happens at 0? Well, hmm, it's a hard question. I, I should just pause and comment here. If you ever are given a piecewise function, this is how you can take derivatives. You just take the derivative of the different pieces. 
which you might see one at some point. I, have, I haven't, I don't remember all the homework problems. Um, what happens at zero? Well, suppose I were to blow up zero, like we did on the first day of class. What happens? Well, it doesn't matter how close I zoom in. It always looks the exact same. I mean, I could keep zooming in forever, but I don't, don't want to you know, use up too much five-port space. So this is a case where when I zoom in on the function, I don't get a, a straight line. So there is no tangent line at zero. And so at x equals zero, it does not exist. So here's an example of where the tangent line doesn't exist. Well, if the tangent line doesn't exist, the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. Therefore, the derivative doesn't exist. And we could just do more than geometric intuition. We could also use the definition of the derivative. Because the definition of the derivative at zero, so f prime of zero, by definition, is the limit as h goes to zero of the absolute value of h minus absolute value of zero over h. Of course, the absolute value of zero is nothing. So it's the absolute value of h over h. And we see that from the left, if we look at this as a one side limit, it approaches negative one. From the right, it approaches one. And therefore, since the two one side limits don't agree, then the limit doesn't exist. Now, I, I should say that there are even much worse examples than this. So here's a function where the derivative doesn't exist at a single point. You can also construct functions where derivatives only exist at a single point. But in fact, you can also construct functions where the derivative doesn't exist at any point. And no matter how you, you, you draw it, so this is really not y equals a function of x, but uh, there's something called Brownian motion, studied in physics, where you know, if you look at it, it looks very erratic, and then if you were to zoom in, you say, okay, well, maybe if I zoom in, it doesn't look so erratic. No, it still looks erratic when you zoom in. And if you zoom in closer, well, maybe that helps. No, it still looks erratic, you know? No matter what scale you zoomed in in, it was always this crazy, crazy thing. Uh, so Brownian motion, this is, I believe, I'm not a physicist, the motion of, of particles. It's been studied by lots of physicists, including Einstein. This is one of the things he studied. Of course, he studied everything, so, you know, uh, good guy. So. so in mathematics, there's this fun thing called the Erdős number, where it shows you how close you are to a certain mathematician. And so they say, well, how many, you know, how many papers did you call, did you call through a paper with somebody who called through a paper with someone who called through a paper with Erdős? And uh, so Einstein actually had a graduate student called Strauss, and he wrote a paper with uh, a mathematician named Erdős, so he has Erdős number two. I also have Erdős number two. So, yeah. All right, anyways, stories for another class. Okay, so derivatives don't always exist, so just be careful. And another moral of the story here, if you have a piecewise function, just take the derivative of the pieces. Of course, what can happen is it is possible for you to have a piecewise function. So for example, it looks something like this, where this is g of x, and it looks like x squared if x is less than or equal to 1. And it looks like 2x minus 1 if x is greater than 1. This is a function which is piecewise. But you can actually check it does have a derivative. I won't go through and, and, and prove that now. Uh, one other thing that causes problems with derivatives is if a function is discontinuous at x equals a, then it does not have a derivative at x equals a. So discontinuities force us to not have deri a derivative. I mean, you can think about the definition of, of the derivative. Because in order for us to have a derivative, you know, the function has to be defined. And really what this says is if you think about what's going on here, this is saying and we're going to talk about this later on in the course, this really says that f of x plus h minus f of x over h is pretty close to f prime of x. Because that's the idea of limits. Limits say that we're getting closer and closer. So this really says that f of x, if you were just to play around with it, rearrange it, um, is approximately f of x plus h plus h f prime of x. And if you think about it, it says, well, really, the function at x near, okay, so near x, 
the function essentially looks like f of x plus, you know, this small error term. So, okay, I'm kind of waving my hands. We're going to go into this in more detail, so don't worry about this right now. But moral of the story is, if there's a discontinuity, you don't even have to do anything automatically. No derivative exists. All right. So, so far, we've done things that are perfectly reasonable. Let's try something which is pretty much unreasonable. So we said that if I take the derivative of a, a sum, you just add the two together, take, add the two derivatives. If I scale it, just scale the derivative. No problems here. So now our first unreasonable thing. Suppose I ask you what the derivative of f of x times g of x is. So in other words, I'm multiplying two functions together. And I say, what's the result if I take the derivative? Now, intuitively, our knee-jerk reaction is to say, ah, oh, you know, everything's been so nice for us. Maybe I can just do something like this. Take the derivative of f of x times the derivative of g of x. It would be so wonderful if this were true. Math would be nice. Calculus would be easy. Uh, but it's probably not true, because, you know, the way I'm talking. So let, let's try this out as an example. So suppose I ask you what the derivative of x squared is. Well, we already figured that out. We went through when we showed that's 2x, right? Well, what's x squared? Well, it's x times x, right? So is this equal to, here's our big question, the derivative of x times the derivative of x? Because essentially, if this were true, then think of this as my first function of x, think of this as my second function, g of x, well, what's the derivative of x? 1. So this would be 1 times 1, which is 1. Now, let's check. Does 2x equal 1? Well, there's going to be a smart that says, oh, wait a second, Professor Bell. Yeah, it does. x equals a half. Ha, ha, ha. But that's, I want it for every x, not just x equals a half. So no, these are not equal as functions. Sure, I can make it equal at one point, but that's really stupid. We're not going to get anything off of that. Okay, so, so the simple... Obvious thing is wrong. All right. So we have to cross that out. No. So now we have to think, okay, well, if it's not the obvious thing, what is it? Well, let's just run through the definition. And hopefully the definition will tell us what we should do. Okay, so by definition, this is the limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h times g of x plus h minus f of x times g of x all over h. All I've done is put that into the definition of what the derivative is. We've already seen this a lot today. Now, we look at this and we say, well, how are we going to deal with this? It, it seems kind of weird because we have x plus h and x plus h here. We have x and x here. So after staring at this for a long time, Matheson said, well, okay, here's what we'll do. We're going to add zero. The way we add zero, there's a couple ways to do it. Is I'm going to first subtract f of x times g of x plus h. Then I'm going to add f of x times g of x plus h into the middle. But everything else stays the same. If I subtract and add something, everything, nothing else changes, then certainly I get adding 0, which is fine. So is this a, a reasonable, although somewhat unpredicted thing to do? OK, so I'm, I will I'll, I'll interpret as yes. OK, good. Well, why do I like that? Well, let's break this up into two pieces. Think of this as my first piece. What do you see that they have in common? Yeah, they have a g of x plus h in common. So now that they have something in common, I can pull that out. And that's really why I did this. Well, so I could pull out that extra term. So f of x plus h minus f of x, g of x plus h. And then I'll put it over h here. OK, so that's coming from the first piece. Now, the second piece is here, Now, and plus the h. What do those have in common? They have f of x in common. 
So plus f of x times what's left when I pull out g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. OK, so now let's think about what happens as h goes to 0. What does this become? Yeah, this is the derivative of f. That's just the definition of the derivative of f. So if h goes to 0, that looks like f prime of x. What does this become? Just plug in h equals 0. Yeah, g of x. So f prime of x times g of x. Plus, what does this become? <laughs> That's easy. There's no h, so it's always f of x. It's a constant. And what does this become? Yeah, it becomes g prime. So that we get the derivative of f of x, or the derivative of the first, times g of x, or times the second, plus the first function, f of x, times the derivative of g of x, or the derivative of the second. And that's where we have to leave it for today, and we'll pick it up on Friday. I have office hours this afternoon. Don't forget, your first homework is due on this Friday, either beginning or end of class. So make sure you get it done.